Okay, um, I want to echo everyone else in thanking Molly for organizing such an awesome meeting. Um, so, from early in our history, evolutionary biologists have thought of speciation in terms of this branching tree. Um, but even at the time of Darwin, we realized that this was an oversimplification of the process of divergence between lineages. But as you've heard in, in talks today, um, I think it's only recently that we've um, come to like a full appreciation of how much of an oversimplification this was. And if we were to redraw this classic figure in evolutionary biology today, we might characterize it more like this, um, a, a sort of web of gene flow occurring before, during, and after divergence between lineages. And this is certainly the case in the species group that um, I have been focusing on, the swordtail fish, which are a group of freshwater fish found mainly in Mexico and Central America. Um, and one of my first PhD projects really shaped the way that I've been thinking about this problem. Um, so we were trying to infer relationships between species um, using a large number of gene trees. And in doing so, we saw really strong evidence for discordance that we ultimately concluded was due to gene flow. Um, and this gene flow was uh, operating on both historical and contemporary timescales, such that um, in some of the modern species that we were studying, upwards of 10% of the genome had been initially derived by hy from hybridization. Um, and so this really pushed me to think about how hybridization sort of integrates with other ways that the genome evolves in trying to understand its role in evolution. Um, and so in order to, to understand this, I think we need to focus on understanding what happens after hybridization. Um, so one of the processes that we've heard a lot about are um, these sorts of genetic interactions that occur in hybrids and um, uh, these conflicts between parental species genomes. Um, but other um, factors that we need to consider are um, the ecological um, environments in which hybrids find themselves, as well as their ability to find mates and successfully reproduce. Um, and today, I'm just going to focus on, on these kinds of genetic interactions, but I don't want to ignore that this is happening in a much larger behavioral and ecological scenario. Um, so the work that I'm going to tell you about today focuses on two closely related species of swordtail fish, Xiphophorus malinche and Xiphophorus birchumni. These species are about a half a percent divergent on the sequence level, um, which is reflected also in their morphological, behavioral, and ecological divergence. They hybridize at intermediate elevations, and they actually hybridize in multiple river systems, which gives us a really um, nice tool to try to understand the predictability of hybridization. Um, a lot of the data that we use to study these populations um, is local ancestry data, which Jenny gave a really nice introduction to. Um, I'm happy to talk in more detail about the kinds of approaches we use, but just to give you a quick introduction, um, the basic approach we use to study most of these questions is we um, collect a fin clip from a natural hybrid, and we extract DNA, and we sequence um, to about 1x whole genome uh, coverage. And then we map those reads to both the Malinche and Birchmanai parental genomes, and we um, make sort of a table of counts of um, reads at ancestry informative markers that are fixed differences between the species. Um, and then we apply a hidden Markov model to locally infer tracks that have been derived from each parental species. So here is shown a chromosome from an individual in our Tlatamaco population. You can see these chunks derived from the birch parent, um, those derived from the Malinche parent, and then these regions that are heterozygous in ancestry. Um, and so this, this data set um, has allowed us to ask a lot of powerful questions um, about the history of the populations and selection on them. Um, and one thing that um, came out of some of our early data um, was this um, observation that many of the populations we were looking at appear to have formed really recently. So as recombination occurs, it breaks down associations between, um, between uh, genetically linked sites. And so you can use the decay of admixture linkage disequilibrium over genetic distance with a lot of simplifying assumptions to, um, to try to understand when hybrid populations first form. Um, and so when we apply um, these methods to our um, three different hybrid populations, we get estimates of initial admixture that are quite recent, between about 20 and 100 generations. Um, and so this is um, really exciting to me, being interested in these early generations since hybridization um, as a way to sort of connect um, selection on hybrids early on to these genome-wide patterns of admixture that we see over longer timescales. Um, 
And a lot of our work has focused on, um, on trying to understand the role of hybrid incompatibilities in this process. And so this has already been introduced, um, but the basic idea, which was independently proposed by Dobzhansky and Muller, um, is that you have this ancestral population that subdivides into daughter populations, and the daughter populations will accumulate and fix new mutations. Um, and these mutations will either be neutral or advantageous within, um, within that genome, but if these species come back together and hybridize, you can have these negative interactions um, between these mutations that haven't been tested together before. Um, and this model um, fits very well with a lot of observations um, in the literature, um, particularly um, observations about reduced hybrid viability and reduced hybrid fertility that have been mapped in, in lab organisms. Um, but I've been very interested in trying to bring this um, to natural hybrid populations where we can understand its role in, um, in populations where um, these sorts of uh, mechanisms of selection on hybrids are going to be very important. Um, so we've done a, sort of a wide variety of work on this. Um, one of the, the things that we did early on was try to identify pairs of loci um, that, that show sort of underrepresentation um, compared to what you would expect given the ancestry frequency at the, at the two loci in that population. Um, and using this kind of approach um, in each of our three hybrid populations, we could identify a fairly large number of sites um, shown here on the sword tail genome that might be candidates for these kind of incompatible interactions. Um, and we've been trying to push that further lately um, and now have um, a really nice time series data set spanning about 30 generations, uh, 20 to 30 generations in three independent populations where we can track these loci over time and, and sort of see selection in action. Um, and one of the other um, focuses that, that we've been um, using this data for is to try to understand how selection on, on these sites sort of remodels ancestry and neighboring sites along the genome. Um, but today, I'm going to tell you about uh, work that's sort of a deviation from some of these genome-wide um, signals that we've been looking at and really focuses on a single hybrid incompatibility that we've been trying to understand in detail. Um, and to tell you about this, I need to start off by telling you about a trait. This trait is called the spotted caudal. It's this collection of uh, macromelanocytes that uh, form on the caudal fin of, of birch fly. Um, it's at intermediate frequencies in birch fly. It's completely absent in Malinche. Um, and we noticed something interesting might be going on with this trait um, as we began to look in hybrid populations. We saw that the, um, the incidence of this trait were very high in hybrid populations, especially given what we knew about the mixture proportions of those populations, um, we would have expected it to be at lower frequency. Um, so this um, led us to, to speculate that there might be some kind of epistatic interaction between the Birchmai and Malinche genomes that, that could increase the expression of this trait in some way. Um, and indeed, as we look in sort of in more detail at the phenotypes themselves, um, we noticed um, some, something really different about the hybrid phenotypes compared to the, the Birchmai the Birchmai phenotype. So in Birchmai, the spot is always contained on the fin, and it never moves into the, the musculature and the body. Um, and you can see that here um, in this phenotype that we've quantified as an invasion area. Um, while in our hybrid populations, we see a lot of variation in this, but we do see um, a lot of evidence of movement of, of these melanocytes into the body. And in some cases, this can be quite extreme. So to show you an example of an individual from this population with a pretty extreme phenotype, um, I have an individual here from a Chihuahua Falls population. Um, and we've now raised individuals in the lab, and we can actually track the progression of their phenotype from a very contained spot, like you see in Birch and I, to this um, sort of expanding spot that's actually moving into the muscle of, of the caudal fin. Um, and so we've been working to try to understand what's going on here um, with a really great group of molecular biologists. Um, and what we see, um, if you take a histological cross-section here, of the uh, caudal peduncle, right where the muscle, um, right where it goes into the muscle, um, we actually see in these individuals with very advanced cases a lot of invasion of melanocytes and even invasion into the muscle bundles themselves. And over time, this will become more extreme, and you'll actually see degradation of the muscle bundles. Um, so this caused us um, to to think that we we're probably looking at a melanoma, especially what's um, known in other swordtail fish. 
Um, we also did um, some gene expression comparisons for enriched pathways between individuals that had this invasive um, versus non-invasive phenotype of, of the same um, genetic background. And we see enrichment of a lot of pathways that are known to be involved in melanoma, um, as well as some sort of general um, cancer-related uh, pathways. Um, so we were then interested in trying to understand um, whether this is sort of a true hybrid incompatibility and we could map the basis of it. Um, so we took a couple of different approaches to try to get at the precise regions underlying the, this trait in um, Birchmine hybrids. Um, so our first approach was to try to identify the genetic basis of the spot um, because individuals without a spot never develop melanoma. So that's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, so the approach that we took here was to use basically a case control GWAS where we had about 200 individuals with the spot and about 200 individuals without. Um, and then we basically scanned the genome for allele frequency differences between these two mores. Um, and in doing so, um, we see some, some signal elsewhere in the genome, but um, our strongest signal by far is um, on chromosome 21. Um, and if we zoom in on that chromosome, we actually see that there are um, a couple of distinct signals here. Um, so um, around 18 megabases and around 22 megabases. Um, and what's quite interesting um, and immediately jumped out to us is that this peak, um, our stronger peak, contains only a single gene, which is um, the X mark gene. Um, and I just want to note that there's also an X mark paralog over here, but it's not um, completely overlapping with our second peak. Um, so why is this exciting? Well, um, Claudia gave a great introduction yesterday. Um, uh, we didn't coordinate, but um, uh, the X mark gene has been previously mapped as uh, the genetic basis of a body melanoma that occurs when you cross two really distantly related species of swordtail fish. Um, and it interacts, um, so it develops from speckles on the body, so it's a very different starting phenotype. You can see here um, a melanoma individual. And it interacts with an unknown region um, uh, that they have called in this classical work the tumor suppressor gene in the other ancestry background. Um, and the reason that I was so surprised about this um, is that um, Hellerae and Maculatus are, are deeply diverged species um, and, um, and in turn are both quite diverged from Birchmine and Malinche. Um, so it seems surprising to me that there, uh, there was at least you know, a partially shared genetic basis of, of this phenotype. Um, so I'll return to that later, um, but I want to tell you next about our admixture mapping. Um, so we, um, uh, with our admixture mapping, can then um, sort of move beyond the, the presence absence of the spot and look at the sort of aggressiveness of this expansion of the spot. Um, the first thing we did want to do, though, was to confirm that the presence and absence was um, controlled by the same loci in Birchmanai as in hybrids. Um, and so uh, we first did map presence absence, and we see in our admixture mapping results um, a single association on chromosome 21 um, in the same region that we identify these associations in Birchmanai. Um, and this is associated with Birchmai ancestry. So individuals that have Birchmai ancestry are more likely to have the spotting phenotype. So we then uh, turn to understanding um, the variation in phenotype that we see in hybrids, but not in the parental species. And so we then classified individuals as whether they had um, what we perceived as a, a Birchmai sp Birch spot, which is this contained spot, um, or individuals that actually had movement of the melanocytes into the body. So we call this an invasion phenotype. Um, and so when we map this, um, we again see this uh, region associated with Birchmai ancestry on the same part of chromosome 21, uh, but we now detect a second region associated with Malinche ancestry on chromosome 5. Um, so this kind of pairing of Birchmai and Malinche ancestry in the trait suggests that we could be looking at sort of a classic in hybrid incompatibility where combining these two ancestries um, leads to this, this deleterious phenotype. Um, so if we look in, in more detail at the particular breakdown, um, what we can see, um, uh, that becomes a little more clear. So um, what we can see is that individuals um, that have melanoma um, all have Birchmai ancestry at chromosome 21, as well as Malinche ancestry on chromosome 5. Um, and what's, what's sort of striking to us in, in looking at this breakdown is we're actually able to see that um, just a single uh, Birchmai allele at chromosome 5 seems to be somewhat protective against um, this invasion phenotype, um, which is something we're excited to follow up on. So what's going on in this chromosome 5 region? 
Um, well, we ended up getting really lucky with this mapping um, because with uh, admixture mapping of a population of this age, we wouldn't really expect to have a ton of resolution. Um, but this happens to be in a very high recombination rate region of the genome, um, and it only contained two genes. Um, so uh, one of these genes is a fatty acid, and we've been able to show with our RNA-seq data that's ovary specific. Um, so we're now um, focusing on this other gene, which is a homologue of, of the human gene CD97. Um, and we sort of immediately looked in our RNA-seq data that we had collected and saw that this, this gene was upregulated in individuals that had this invasion compared to individuals with normal or no spot, again, of the same genetic background. Um, and as we dug into the human literature, um, we saw that um, this was sort of typical of, of cancers in general. So in, um, uh, uh, this gene is expressed at very low levels in normal tissues, but is ex expressed at moderate or high levels in a number of cancers. And there's been some really nice recent work that has actually um, shown uh, with genetic manipulations that uh, this high expression of this gene is actually linked to the, the transition to met metastasis. So we were really curious about whether um, there might be some evolution of, of higher expression of this gene in Malinche. Um, and so we uh, decided to tackle that with a qPCR-based approach. And what we see is, although there, there's quite a lot of variation in expression, we see markedly higher expression of this gene in Malinche. Um, and if we move then to looking at F1 hybrids and, and some natural hybrids with melanoma, we again see um, this Malinche-like expression pattern, um, which suggests that um, hybrids could be inheriting this um, high expression of CD97, which um, we, we believe may be incompatible with having X mark on chromosome 21. Um, one thing I just want to note is um, it appears that this is not a tissue-specific expression difference between the species. Um, all the tissues that we have RNA-seq data from, we see this sort of constitutively higher expression in Malinche. Um, okay, so for the first part of my talk, I just want to sort of step back um, and say um, we, uh, what I think is really interesting about this in part is that we see um, a sort of a shared um, genetic basis of, of this melanoma incompatibility in these two really divergent crosses. However, it's only partially shared. We see the X mark gene in both cases, um, but the partners that we infer are different from those in the classical cross, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, but I think it's really interesting um, to entertain this idea, which we have um, not um, anywhere close to enough evidence to really evaluate um, that there might be certain genes that um, might be sort of susceptible to these breakdowns in hybrids, and we may begin to see more of these as we map more to the single gene level. Um, another feature of this system that I think makes it really unique and, and stand out from this classical work on melanomas and sore tails is these species are naturally hybridizing, um, whereas Helleri and Maculatus um, do not naturally hybridize. Um, and so um, that makes it really relevant to understand this trait in natural populations. Um, and I'll also say another uh, striking difference is that um, in birch vine Malinche hybrids, the melano melanoma develops early, whereas in Helleri maculatus hybrids, it may develop sort of post-reproductively. Um, and so um, indeed, we've been able to, to look at this in natural hybrid populations and try to begin to get a handle on what's going on. Um, so we've been collecting juvenile and adult frequencies from two hybrid populations that have high incidence of melanoma over three years. And we see very consistent, although noisy, shifts in frequency of the trait between juvenile and adulthood. We do not see this in lab individuals, nor do we see it in the parental species where um, the spot exists but melanoma does not. Um, and so we're really interested in the idea um, that there may be some sort of viability um, consequence of having this expanded spot um, that contributes to this drop off between juveniles and adults. And we think um, there are a lot of possible causes of that viability difference, um, but one which we're currently pursuing with a really great group of Mexican collaborators um, is um, as the spot becomes really, uh, the melanoma becomes really advanced, individuals start to lose parts of their caudal fin. So this is an individual who's lost a, a big chunk of her caudal fin. Um, and we predict that this is going to have a big impact on, on swimming ability. Um, but I just want to point out that far before you have this sort of fin loss, um, the invasion of the musculature in the caudal peduncle here um, may have an impact on swimming because it, it starts to degrade pretty early on. Um, and one real puzzle um, that we're, I think, still really early in understanding um, is 
Um, why this trait is still present in the hybrid populations that we study, which I told you earlier, we estimate be to be between about 20 and 100 generations old, depending on the population. Um, and um, if we take those juvenile and adult frequencies and make some simplifying assumptions about the genetic architecture, um, we estimate very strong selection coefficients that are consistent with that shift. Um, such that we would really expect that this trait should be efficiently purged from the hybrid populations by um, the time uh, that we're sampling. Um, so this is a sort of in um, a spawning of a bunch of new projects to try to understand what forces might be maintaining it. Um, the very last thing I want to talk to you about is um, is the evolution of this trait in sort of the broader context of, of the sword tail phylogeny. Um, and how the sort of pervasive history of hybridization might be influencing this trait. Um, so we um, had previously found evidence of, of pretty ancient introgression um, from the species called Diphophorus variatus um, into species in the birch mimolinchae clade, into all three of these species. Um, and variatus is sympatric with all three of these species, um, so, so this seems plausible that, that we would have this gene flow. Um, but another thing that really caught our attention for this project in particular is that um, Variatus, Cortesi, and Bertrami are the only three species in the clade that have tail spots. So many of the other species have spots on different parts of their body, um, but we thought that this gene flow from Variatus might be sort of an interesting mechanism um, to, to look at further. Um, and just to sort of focus your attention, um, we um, don't find uh, really strong evidence for this at, at the X mark QTL, but if we focus on the second QTL, which I haven't told you much about, um, we actually see a really distinct um, pattern of, of um, relationships between species in this region. Um, so um, we see that both Variatus and Cortesi are closely related to Variatus, or sorry, both Cortesi and Birchmai are closely related to Variatus in this region, whereas other species that genome-wide are more closely related are outgroups. Um, and this kind of um, discordance between the gene tree and species tree can be generated by a lot of processes, including hybridization and incomplete lineage sorting. Um, but for incomplete lineage sorting, we would expect that um, the coalescence times between the Variatus and Cortesi and Variatus and Birchmai um, genes would be quite, quite deep. Um, and if we look at local divergence in this region um, compared to expectations um, based on coalescent simulations, we can see that both Birchmai and Cortesi are very closely related to Variatus in this region, whereas their sister clades or sister species in the case of Malinche are not and sort of fall within the expectation um, of divergence between Variatus and this northern swordtail group. Um, so I think it's um, really exciting um, to, to think about whether this locus might be involved in the patterning we see, um, given that spots are found throughout the genus, but this tail spot patterning is only found in these three species. Okay, um, I'm gonna end there by saying that um, I've told you a lot about this particular melanoma hybrid incompatibility that we've been working on, and I, I'm really excited about this work, but it's just a small part of the picture of the landscape of, of selection on hybrids. And um, I'm hoping that in coming years, in, in both sword tails and other species, we'll have a better understanding of these genetic mechanisms and how they influence evolution in the genome. Um, I want to end by um, thanking the people who have really driven this work, particularly Dan Powell, who's starting a postdoc in my lab. Mackenzie Keegan did all of the wet lab work that I, that I told you about today. And Mateo Garcia is a grad student who's been working on this. I also want to thank our, our collaborators on this project um, and also my mentors, two of whom I'm lucky to have in the audience today.